Well, uh, hello everyone. I hope you can see me. <laughs> Hi. Glad to see that none of you have skipped out for Wednesday night cocktails and you guys are all here to celebrate 50 years of Earth Day. So cheers to that. Many of you here might be wondering who we, the Indian Youth Climate Network are, especially since many of us don't really qualify as youth anymore. <laughs> okay, I'm just joking. So as long as you feel youthful, you're welcome here at IYPN. On a more serious note, we're a youth-driven nonprofit in that all our projects are driven by the youth and are for the youth. We set up shop in 2008, and uh, this was uh, right after the 2007 United Nations uh, COP summit in Bali, where a couple of young Indian climate activists were present, and they realized that India did not really have a representation on the global stage as far as climate activism was concerned. And it is from that realization that IYCN was born. So we happen to be a pan-India youth organization. And uh, as you can tell, our motto is climate activism and environmental activism. And uh, I'm really happy to acknowledge that ours is a truly diverse group. So we have members from the length and breadth of the country. Our president Raka is from Meghalaya. I am from Bengal. And our host for this evening, our moderator Karthike, he's from Madhya Pradesh. So, uh, okay, now let's let's talk about uh, the topic for today, which is reshaping mental model for eco-friendly decision making. Sounds like a very long sentence, doesn't it? We had to make it look serious so you'd take us seriously. <laughs> but uh, jokes apart, what is a mental model? A, a mental model is nothing but your thought processes, the, the way your mind works, the way you think. And why is this important for any kind of decision making, especially related to the environment? Just like any other action that you take, uh, your thought process is important because your thoughts drive your actions. Your thoughts, first of all, drive your beliefs. And those beliefs drive your actions. So if you aren't thinking in the right direction, then I'm afraid the actions that you're going to take are not going to be in tandem with some intentions you might have. So as you know, there are plenty of climate deniers, climate change deniers everywhere across the world, including uh, you know, leaders of countries. I'm sure many of us are familiar with some of them. Uh, in order for yeah, people to change their uh, behavior towards the environment and their attitudes, the first thing that needs to change is their mindset. Our, many of our leaders have abdicated that responsibility already. So we, the youth, need to kind of take over here because uh, we are the future in that sense. So as you see, people, young people like Greta are leading movements all across the world. And Greta is just one face. There are so many other young people in our very own country, in our villages, people who you may not ever have heard of. And they are leading their own movements every single day. The, this, the, the, the saying that every drop builds the ocean is perfectly true in this case. Uh, for example, some of us might have heard of the forest man of India, Jada Fahim, who's from Assam. And he's been planting trees for decades since the late 1970s to save the Majuli Islands, which happens to be the largest river island in the world. So Jadav is not somebody who's got a lot of technical expertise or who went to a fancy college or who received any kind of um, you know, environmental education. So I think a lot of what stops many of us uh, young people or otherwise from taking any kind of action uh, towards climate change is that uh, we feel that we need a special kind of education or technical expertise to be able to contribute uh, you know, uh, significantly. But that isn't the case anymore. Every little action that you take, be it uh, taking a shorter bath at home, or uh, you know, not wasting food, or for example, becoming more vegetarian in your uh, lifestyle. I won't say, okay, stop eating your chicken or fish or whatever you're eating, but you know that small direction. You don't have to have chicken and meat every day. You can maybe consume it once a month or once a week or whatever. So every little step that you take will help. Our attitude today is so consumerist, is so capitalist that uh, we've completely lost the plot. And 
I think amidst this coronavirus quarantine that all of us are in, unfortunately, we have taken a moment to notice that our skies are suddenly bluer, our birds are chirping. Uh, have you ever heard birds sing like they are right now? You haven't, and neither have I. You see people, you know, just standing on their terraces admiring the sunset. When has that ever happened? That is one of the, well, probably the only uh, fortunate fallout of this terrible crisis that all of us are in. But that also points us to the direction that we haven't been looking in at all, all these years. The direction that is our future, the future of our generations, which are not going to be able to enjoy a clean, green environment because of the destruction that we have caused over the years. So now that our skies are bluer, our birds are chirpier, we're all very happy to see uh, all the, you know, the, the, the sort of refreshed mother nature around us. This only reiterates how important it is for us to preserve our environment. And for the first time, I think many of us, and I can speak for myself here, that we are starting to think about how important our environment is to us, really. So in light of that, and uh, happy Earth Day to everybody once again, I'd like to welcome uh, to this platform uh, Ms. Geeta Dharmarajan, who is a Padma Shri awardee. She's with the organization Katha. And uh, taking over the reins right now is my colleague uh, uh, Karthike, who will be moderating the session. So welcome, uh, Geeta and Karthike. Thank and thank you. you for being with us this evening. Thank Hi, you. Am, I, thank yeah, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Am I? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Indra. Uh, and uh, yes, happy Earth Day to everyone. It's the 50th Earth Day. It began in 1970, if I'm correct. The celebration of Earth Day began in 1970 to bring to fore the environmental challenges that we are currently facing and it has become far more eminent more than ever to you know talk about these things and as you correctly pointed out indra the sort of realizations uh, that as humans as you know city dwellers as regular folks that we are having like you know just as simple as the uh, being able to listen to the chirping of the birds be able to see clear skies is something that almost at least my generation had sort of given uh, up on like you know uh, i remember hearing them as a kid but as an, as a grown up never so anyways uh, moving forward i'm put today in a very tough position because uh, there, there are a lot of things common between uh, these two great organizations, IYCN and Katha, one of them being me and the fact that both organizations tolerate me a lot. But uh, more importantly, both organizations are driven by passion. That This is something that I really wanted to highlight, take the chance to highlight this, that both of them are driven by passion to you know impact and do something. So not taking more time, I would uh, introduce uh, Gita Ma'am. So Gita Ma'am uh, is an award-winning writer, mentor, innovator, and the founder and the president of Katha. Katha is a not-for-profit which she started in 1988. Passionate about how children learn, she devised the story pedagogy, uh, a powerful classroom learning tool which is used across all the Katha centers, the learning centers, the schools, the community outreach programs that we have um, across various uh, slums, tribal villages, government schools, across India, uh, apparently. And it is her philosophy that uh, children can be the leaders of tomorrow, of the communities that they come from, that she has built this beautiful system of, you know, uh, and which is non-linear, but it, it's sort of a looping system where it's not the learning does not end in the classroom and the learning is not just uh, the fact that what is taught it's also what comes from outside into the classroom and what goes from the classroom to in in your communities and more importantly what students can also teach us right it's not just a one way of learning 
so on behalf of the participants on behalf of iycn i would like to welcome uh you Gita, ma uh and over to you i'm uh, and i'm really happy so we are here and meeting in these COVID times thank you so much Kartike. thank you and i thank uh, iycn for inviting me and asking me to talk over here i hope you can hear me well uh let me start off by wishing all of you a very very happy Earth Day, and I haven't had a hug in a very very long time. So I'm giving you a big hug from here. Can you please give me a hug from wherever you are, please? Thank you. I um, a few years ago I um, I had gone to uh, the Mutumalai. I had gone to the Mudumalai uh, forest and there uh, happened to meet one of the Irulas, they are the tribal people of, uh, of Tamil And uh, one of them was climbing up a tree very, very well and he had gone up with a small glass bottle and he came back with honey, which was just as big as, just as much as what the bottle could hold. So I asked him, but why, uh, I mean, are you not thinking of making it into a business or getting more, you know, make your family more viable? And he said, no, this much is enough for me and I don't want anything else. And then a few years later, I had gone to visit my son in Alipurdwar and he was telling me he's a, he's a vegetarian and he works with wild elephants. And so he was telling me that he had gone one day to see, uh, some of the tribal people living near Alipurdwar and their harvest was just ready and it was just ready for harvesting. It was looking beautiful. The next morning when he went there, there was nothing. He said, what has happened? The elephants had come and they had trampled and they had eaten their fill from the field which was waiting to be harvested by the humans. So my son said, but are you not upset about it? And the tribal people said, well, God has given them such a big belly. So what can they do? They have to eat just as we have to eat. So we'll manage for this time and then we'll see what we can do next time. The kind of tolerance that Earth has and the kind of tolerance that we have as human beings has been growing more and more as a burden on Earth and less and less as a burden on us human beings. I want to go back to my childhood because I think uh, to sort of link up where we are today and how my own uh, mental um, mental framework, mental uh, mental model, mental model. I'm sorry, mental model. Uh, so I was thinking that I need to share with you when I was growing up in Chennai. Uh, I live in Chennai now. I was growing up in Chennai, and it was called Madras at that point of time. And I remember going with my grandmother to buy the provisions. And when we went there, there would be all these little packs on the way out. And you had to put one handful of rice or one handful of uh, dal or one handful of sugar, whatever it is that you have bought, one handful into each of the gunny sacks that was kept over there. So I would always tell my mother, grandmother, you know, let me, let me, let me, let me. And I must have been about five or six years old. Let me put. So she would say, okay, grow up, give once one handful, but I'll have to give with my hands because your hands have to grow. You have to grow to be able to give. So this idea of, you know, waiting to grow so that I could give with my full heart and with my full hand was something that I learned from my grandmother. I learned it from my father also. My father was a doctor and he, he just passed away. He was a doctor and he would take 50 paisa for an injection from anyone who came to his clinic. And um, he would put one rupee back into the pocket of the man and say, please go and buy some fruits or milk or vegetables for your child because that is what your child needs, not an injection for me. So we grew up in an, in an, in an atmosphere, in an, in an ethos where Medicine was not the be all and end all of what we were and who we were. I think when, whenever I came home from school, 
And I said, I have a headache. My father will say, when, or he will say, go and sleep. You must be very tired. Or he would say, go and have a bath. You've been out in the sun, and the Madras sun is very generous. So he would say, okay, go out and have a bath. There were always these kinds of things that we were told rather than saying, okay, pop a pill. So I must have had about 50 crocents maybe in about 50 years of my life. I'm 71 now. So you can see the kind of lives we were living. It, they were frugal. They were, uh, I learned the word much later, sustainable. I didn't know the word at that point in time. So when, when time came for me to sort of move on and my husband, I got married and uh, we came to Delhi, I found the children just to be cheap. And I was quite surprised because in Tamil Nadu, we, we, many of our children could read. So the idea of children not being able to read first was a frustration for me. And then I got very, very angry. And then there was tears. And then there was outrage. I said, how can we do this to our children? I'm basically a writer for children. I do not know anything about writing nonprofits. But I started. Tata in 1988. And um, so the children that you see in front of you uh, are some of the children from our, uh, from our school. Uh, as Kartke say, we are in, in a lot of schools. And one of the things that we realized right in the beginning that I realized in 1988 when I was the only volunteer of the organization. I continue to be a volunteer, but there are lots of other volunteers now that we have. So I realized that Environment and poverty are things education is. They, they, you cannot take one away from the other. If you take away, if you look at, you know, people in poverty, they would be living in environments which are very, very poor. They would be in mosquito infested areas. They would be in disease infested areas. And they would, they would not be able to attend work. They wouldn't be able to attend school. And therefore, they would not be able to become upwardly mobile. They would continue to live in this environment. They will continue to be poor. And so you would have that entrenched poverty that we talked about. So the earliest thing was how do we improve the environment in which our children live? How do we help children to understand that they need a better environment? It's not something that is easy, but Tamasha was a magazine that I started. Uh, it was a, a health environment and stories. So stories came first. So it was stories, health and environment. And so it is a she magazine. And uh, we had lots of, lots and lots of stories with girls in it. Girls who could do anything and could uh, sort of, they could climb trees and we, we continued to break every single stereotype that was there so that we could get our girls to do much more than they were allowed to do or given the freedom to do. From from Tamasha Magazine came our books, and slowly we moved on. Uh, Kartika, can we have the next slide, please? OK. So I found that there were a lot of things. The earlier one, yes, thank you. So you would find that right from Rig Vedic times, when you look at the Irulas, you look at the tribal people in West Bengal, you will know that this is not an instance of isolated thinking. This is how we have been in India. We have been singing the praise of Earth. We have been talking about Earth. And we have been praying to Earth. We have been um, doing our productions of the Tulasi. And if you can see the poem here, it's from the Rig Veda. And it says, whether you're standing or you're sitting or you're standing still, please let me walk softly. And please let me not stumble. So I am putting a burden on myself and I'm putting a burden on earth also. And that was a shared responsibility that from the Rig Vedic times we had for one another. Uh, the next slide, please. So when we came to looking at our children and you'll see our children over here and climate change became a big talk around, uh, around 2006, 2007, even earlier than that, but I think 2000, 2005 maybe I started hearing about it and by 2007 I was wondering for whom are we talking about climate change climate change for people like you and me we can ha handle it like the COVID 
if they tell me stay within, stay indoors, there's a lock, uh, lockdown, I can stay indoors. I have a home. I can stay indoors. But what about the thousands and millions of people in India who cannot stay indoors? And what about the children? How do we protect the children? So the whole idea was, can climate change be something that is important for children? And children realize that this is important. For them. If once they got to know that, maybe they can do something about climate change. So the idea was that we would, uh, I thought that we should take a challenge. It was called the Challenge 2040. And we said, every child will become sustainable will lead a sustainable life. Now, Katha has been making books, I told you, Tamasha Magazine, and I want to go on to the next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the books that we've been making. Over the years, a lot of books on Earth, a lot of books on climate change. The book that you find right to your right-hand side is the Earth Carer's Guide to Climate Change. And I have the book here which you can see better maybe. This is the Hindi version of it. So, so basically the idea was that, you know, if we can talk to the children in their own language and give them the knowledge, give them the right to make a decision for themselves. This was the bold and singular idea that we have in Kappa. That if a child is given the opportunity and given a holistic education, she will stand up for herself and she will do whatever is needed to be done for herself, for her future, for her sustainability. And she will realize her potential. And that was what all these books were trying to do over here. Every single book, whether you're looking at the Earth Song, you're looking at a tree, you're looking at Why Always, beautiful poem by Chris, um, Hans Anderson, award-winning Japanese poet, uh, Michio Mado. So uh, it had Bloomer's uh, abstract art with it. We want children to enjoy the colors of nature, enjoy the world around them, and then to see why and what are they missing out of. You must remember we work in urban slums, mostly. We go into rural areas, but we, I started my life uh, in Kata in urban slums. So uh, can we have the next slide, please? So from 2008, I thought that what would be very nice is to have a whole curriculum revolving around climate change and global warming. The curriculum was built in such a way that we have three trimesters in Qatar. So for every trimester, we would have a book like this. So we had the Think Book and then we have the uh, we had the teachers. They are amazing, awesome teachers who create, took the stories and they created all kinds of things. With so uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So this one uh, you will not be able to see, but this is the 2009 uh, program that we made for ourselves for Akata Shala, which was the main school. And from this school, over time, it went on to government, it went on to other nonprofits, it went on to various other schools. So uh, is it possible to make it a little bigger? Uh, No, that's okay. That's okay. This is actually full screen, so ah, it will be different. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. So basically, what we are seeing is that the mental model that Katha has is a mental model that goes back in time. It goes back to when I was a child and I was learning and I was making mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes in my life. I have not been careful with water. I have not taken a bath very nicely. I think I've spent a lot of water on myself when I'm having a bath. And so when I look at you know all the things that you do which are not right, and then what you learn and how you slowly become a little more aware, a little more conscious of what you're doing. And that is what we were sharing with our children. And our children were amazing. I mean, they picked up ideas as if these were ideas that they were born with. They did not have to change anything. And you must remember that our children are coming from non literate families. They do not have preconceived notions. They don't have Western ideas of non-frugality. They are frugal. 
And that's how most of us in India were. We had a mental model which, which valorized frugality, which said frugal was good. And you use as much as you want. Want not, waste not. This was what we all learned and we lived by. Uh, so I want to move from here to how do we create a generation of children, not just those who are going through the Kata school and who are going to any school anywhere in the country. Is it possible to share this kind of an idea? And I thought that this mental model was what I would like to share with you before we move on and start making a mental model for ourselves. Each one of us can make a mental model. So, um, uh, Kartika, the next one, please. Ah, so we started what we call in Qatar our 300 million challenge. There are 300 million children in our country today who are going to school. And according to everyone, whether you're looking at UNICEF, you're looking at World Bank, you're looking at Government of India, anyone that you can think of will tell you about 50%, one in every two children cannot read. That's 15 crore children who cannot read. Here is India building roads, infrastructure, everything possible. Who's going to sit in them? Only those who studied in the English medium uh, schools? Or do we say that there is equity and there's equality of quality education so that more people can come and more people can become entrepreneurs and more people can go into professions where you don't have to use the resources of nature constantly, use the uh, depletable resources of nature, but can live more frugally and learn from practices from your grandmothers, from your great grandparents or whatever else. So the 300 million challenge has its main topic as global climate change. Okay, uh, can we see the, or is the video on? I'll just play it. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Okay, you can move. Okay, you can move on to the next one slide. Thank you. So basically, I think I showed the 300 million challenge because wherever we are, whatever we do as adults, uh, my time of course is done, and I hope I'll be away very, very soon from this planet, and I don't have to worry about climate change at all <laughs> or worry about anything at all. Uh, I hope that will happen. But for young people like you, like the uh, youth who are looking at climate and looking at that, uh, who have formed the network, and for all of you out there, I think we need to look at not just ourselves, but look at the children. We need to say that it is going to be their planet, it's going to be their Earth, and they have to be in a position to protect it, to look after Earth, and to say that Earth. Mother Earth is bountiful, and we as people need to respect that, and we need to acknowledge that, and we need to be grateful. If we can do that, if our children can learn to be grateful to Mother Earth, then I think we will not be just talking about our planet, we will not just be talking about sending something to Mars and sending something to God knows where, but we will be talking about how our children can live on this planet as happy as possible. Now, I know that each one of you out there is an earth lover and you are an earth carer. So I know, and I want to say, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for joining this and to see whether we as a group can think of a few ways maybe, uh, one way in which each one of us 
can put down a mental map for ourselves, a model for ourselves to say, how can I, when Earth Day is turning 50, we can make a change and we can sort of do something which is different from what we've done. So COVID-19 has, has taught us a lot of things. We've all managed to be very frugal. We've all stayed within our homes. We managed not to waste food because I don't know where I'm going to get my next chance to go to the provision stores and get something in. We managed managing with the alu and arabi and you know managing the things that you have. So a lot of onions going into the body now. So I think we still can. We can do all kinds of other things, but I think we can be frugal. And we can help our children to be frugal. And we can be proper caretakers of this earth, which is ours now, which as has been said, we borrowed from our children. And now it's time that we looked after it properly so that when they come to enjoy it, they will see the birds and they will see the elephants and they will see the rhinoceros. And they will say, yes, this is a beautiful earth that we do. So shall we move on now and go into the discussions, please? And if you have any questions, or can we take out a piece of paper and maybe write down one little thing that we can do to make a change today um, for maybe this whole year, maybe for two years, maybe for five years? Shall we try and do that? Kartike, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, am I visible? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, talking about mental models and uh, I mean, uh, you leave us with at a very opportune time in sense, a uh, lot to think about in terms of mental models that one can create while thinking about the planet uh, planet's future and uh, while we continue talking, I'll just uh, request people to send in the questions uh, so that we can take them one by one. In the meantime, uh, Indra and I will be conversing with you till the time questions start pouring in. Does that work? Okay. Yes. So, uh, Indra, please uh, join us back. So, uh, to kick off, um, I, I it just got me thinking about uh, a lot of things in, in terms of also climate change. Uh, I mean, a lot of us are aware of its realities and yet in denial. But and at the same time, then, as you also correctly pointed out, uh, not everybody is privileged to be on here to have a house, or have a roof on top of their head. So thinking about that population and how, how can one create or how can one make a common man or a common person, not to gender it, a common person associate with uh, such an idea? You know, we try with children, but uh, increasingly we see elders like not associating themselves with the idea of climate change. So how can we do that? What kind of mental model can we create to engage that population? You know? Okay, I think we have a lot of naysayers, as Indra had pointed out much earlier, and I think sometimes they carry the uh, the vote most of the time because it's easier for us to say there's nothing like climate change. That's not happening. And even though we see a lot of rains happening, we see a lot of drought happening, we see unseasonal things happening. Mango trees are blossoming, you know, at a time when they shouldn't be blossoming at all. We see all these things around us. We don't hear the birds. We don't hear, you know, uh, when I was growing up, I used to hear the wolves right down from my grandparents' house. And they lived there, right? Really, I mean, we could hear them. And it was a very nice thing to know that, yes, they are there, but I'm not going to be worried about them. See, you could see the stars. You could see the sky. And now most of us are not even able to see any of these things. So when I start very voluntarily looking for beauty, and that is what I think the COVID has taught us, COVID-19 has taught us, that when you get used to something that is good, you want to be able to share, or you want it to last a little longer. Now, all of us definitely, we, we know that the earth is much happier. We know from the seismic uh, studies that have happened, 
we know from you know the kind of studies that are happening across the world on how much of noise and how much of pollution has been reduced the yamuna is running very very clear now the ganga is running clear now and i think we are seeing with our own eyes that even a few days of respite for earth seems to be enough for earth to pick up and say yes i think that's all i need now supposing we can do that every year and if earth day didn't come just once a year but was there every day for like maybe for one hour was earth hour that we all celebrated at which time we switch off our lights maybe we eat more frugally or we we sort of uh, play with our children we turn off the television whatever it may be there are little little things that we can do and i think change change management is one of the most difficult things kartike and i don't know how quickly we can do that but i think you guys are doing a very very good job and i think yes more power to you guys thank you with your guidance uh, surely we will be needing it uh, indra uh, i guess over to you thank you so much geeta and kartike and um, we're really happy to have katha collaborate with us this evening in fact uh, this is only the beginning of many uh, future collaborations i hope <laughs> because where your minds are you know in tandem and where your goals are common you have to come together again right <laughs> absolutely thank you everybody whoever's been uh, watching and whoever's uh, looped in this evening thanks a ton for your time uh, a small request so or rather an announcement so uh, we at iycn are open to taking in new members uh, don't worry about how old you are age it does not matter just because like i said earlier just because it's the indian youth climate network doesn't mean you have to be youth you just have to feel youthful <laughs> that's all so uh, feel free to join us and in order to join and kind of whatever queries you have about membership write to us at contact c o n t a c t at i y c n dot i n and you guys going to have the last word uh, can i get a big hug can i get a big hug from everyone for earth so if each one of us wherever we are can give earth a big hug i close my eyes i can hear earth hmm a big 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 hug thank we you everyone we are happy to write back thank <laughs> you thank you so thank uh, you. before we are not closing in yet we still have some time so questions have fine started to pour in so uh while well, we have to be creative with the fillers don't we so uh so there is one question that uh, we have got that uh, children are important as uh, earth stewards uh, what would you suggest in terms of mental models to train teachers instructors preachers for making ecology easier for kids and students to appreciate so this is one question for you geeta ma'am i think ecology is a very difficult word environment is an easier word so i think uh, once teachers are able to move out of their i think two things are needed for teachers one they need a little more agency most teachers don't have that agency and they are not able to decide on what is it that they can teach or should teach and they are held um captive by the syllabus that has been given to them or the curriculum that so chances for them to be creative within that sometimes becomes a problem so now kata for instance uh, we we are creating a website that we are calling just imagine and we are saying that you know you can come here and you can sort of do a lot of things that you want to do and teachers can learn from here and we have a website in hindi the padok tyar se website which gives a lot of tips to teachers which has also has training for teachers which they can come and take so we need to move out of the very very structured teacher training to something that we would be would like to call teacher education is it possible to look at teacher education and see how for instance when i'm looking at any of these books this is a book on the tree for instance 
that we had done. And each of these pages, for instance, you'll find there is a tree and the poem is very simple. It's just one line at the bottom. And we just had a eight line poem that we took and we created into a whole book with tribal art in it, full of tribal art. So when you're looking at books like this, then I think teachers would also feel excited about innovating, bringing this into a classroom, which does not probably talk about something like this. So once I think, I, I don't know whether you've heard about this person called Rupert Sheldrake. He talks about, you know, morphogenetics. He says, once something starts happening, it will keep happening. Once there's been a field built for dinosaurs, there'll be more dinosaurs. I think once we manage to build a field for teachers who are interested in climate, in climate change, in environment, in gender, in breaking stereotypes, because that is what we need. We need to break the stereotypes we created over the last, just a generation, just over the last 40, 50 years, I think we can do it. I think we Indians are good at doing it. And I, I'm very hopeful that we can make it happen. Did I answer the question at all? I guess, I think, um, well, um, <laughs> it makes Too sense. It, it makes sense in the sense, uh, you know, a lot of structures, a lot of uh, systemic change is required. I mean, uh, that what you have been referring to, right? Creating that sort of space for creativity, creating that space for ideas to evolve, in not just in classrooms, but in our daily lives as well. So yes, that is definitely, and I think it is creativity and uh, newer ideas and, you know, sort of following up on them and giving them space is what will actually help uh, humanity to tackle climate change in the long run. Because currently as it's becoming more and more visible that the current structure systems are failing us, you know, so yeah. So over to the next question, um, what contribution can eco-feminist models make in the current times? So, yeah. Well, a lot, a lot. I think eco-feminism has always talked about saving, you know, seeds, saving, working with the people. I think, you know, when POSCO and various people came in, uh, uh, into, into our country and we could not save our seeds and we could not sort of, plant them again, we had to go back to commercialism was taking over everything that we had, uh, even a simple act as, you know, farmers planting their own trees. And I think ecofeminism has come in a very, very big way to see how can we empower women who are in communities, in urban and rural communities, in rural communities especially to think of themselves as feminists and to think of themselves as feminists, not just looking at women's rights, but looking at the rights of earth, the rights of environment to make things happen. So uh, in another question we have here is, uh, we are in the midst, uh, midst of a climate health crisis uh, where doctors are on the front line and they are they're on the front lines and uh, the public health crisis is due to be degrade is due to the degrading uh, environment around us so do you have a message for the doctors for the people on the front line what can we say i mean they are amazing people awesome i mean they take on the role that you know people like us are not able to I offered to my doctor, I have a doctor in Chennai. I said, can I come and help? And he said, at your age, just stay indoors. So you'll find that, you know, there are some of us who want to go out and do something and we are not able to, and some who are not able to do it for various other reasons. And not just the doctors, the police people, the sanitary workers, the people who are, you know, running errands for various people. I think we, as, the middle class sometimes take the people who come in as helpers for granted. We don't appreciate what they give and how they are. We don't appreciate nurses at all. I know how sometimes people are so rude to nurses and to doctors. I know that these news has been coming in the newspapers 
where doctors in Chennai have not been able to, after they got the COVID and they died of the COVID-19, were not given a good burial, a proper burial. So what is it? Why is it that, you know, as people, it's not just doctors, it's just that, you know, we have become a more and more and more divided nation. We don't seem to believe in unity. We don't seem to believe in diversity. We don't seem to believe in homogeneity at all. Uh, we, uh, in, um, not, we believe only in homogeneity. We don't believe in heterogeneity. So at what point are we going to change? When are we going to say that diversity is important? I think the doctors, the nurses, the uh, sanitary workers, the people out there, the policemen, one of my uh, friends, uh, her husband was not well, and uh, she just couldn't lift him. He had fallen down. She called the doctor, uh, she called the policeman, and the policeman came immediately to help her and to uh, lift her husband, put him on the bed. I mean, this is the kind of service that the police people are giving and other people are giving. So I think a big, big, big salute to each one of them for keeping our country safe during these horrible, horrible times. And in fact, they are the actually the real change makers. You know, the they agents, are. you know, they are they are fighting a battle that uh, on the front lines, dealing with so much pressure, yes. so much yes. you know, tension and uh, like I, I don't know, I'm running out of words out here in the sense of <laughs> No, they are definitely our warriors out there, you know, exactly. supporting the real one of change one. Yes. And uh, taking uh, more questions. Uh, so, there's, uh, I mean, when it comes to uh, change, one, uh, larger bringing about change, then we also bring in the whole idea of climate change. Some people prefer to call it climate crisis in today's day. The, uh, there's, a, there's a certain amount of hopelessness around to it in the sense that we don't see our leaders doing anything about it. There are no concrete policies coming. And as repeatedly it has been uh, talked about that there are naysayers, there are deniers. What as an individual, as an individual living in the city, you know, uh, it's not necessarily always that you have to go out somewhere in the forest to uh, plant the seed. Or something but as city dwellers what as uh, as individuals as community or like just earth carers as you call them like you know who care for the, our planet what can we do is one of the questions that is coming up and people want to know from you i feel any simple act that any one of us can do for instance uh, if I look at Chennai, Chennai used to have a lot of these avenue trees. They used to be so shaded. You could just walk down any street. Uh, Delhi used to be like that. Lots of, you know, trees on the, on the roads. Now we've cut all the trees. Maybe I can go and plant a tree just outside my home, just outside my colony to see that, you know, maybe 50 years down the line, there'd be a tree over there or even 10 years down the line, there'd be a tree which can give shade. And if all of us are doing just that one simple thing, I think that will bring down not just pollution. It, it, there is a selfish thing also over here. I think I'm being very selfish when I say that I would like more rain. I would like the weather to be a little cooler. And planting trees is one of the best ways we can do it. So I'm doing something for planet Earth while I'm doing something to help myself. This coexistence this living together is something that i think we can all do and one thing that the covid has taught us covid 19 has taught us is this that earth takes very very little time to recuperate to spring back and to be there for human beings so instead of putting ourselves in the center as somebody had said and saying that all of nature is around me to serve me if we can put ourselves as part of this whole circle and we become one of them, then I think we will all learn to be maybe a little more mindful of Earth and what is it that we can give back to Earth. Maybe just watering a plant that is there inside, the, inside your compound, inside your colony. There are little, little things that children can do also. Wasting, not wasting, cutting off the electric lights. Now I've got so many lights in this house now because somebody said, you have to be visible. So I'm having so many lights around me now.
But supposing we say that, okay, I'm going to switch off this leg. Does it make a difference? It doesn't make a difference. So I'm thinking that, you know, every little act, every little drop can make a difference. So I think if he starts now, maybe in a year or two years time, maybe the seismic noises will be less. Earth will be not so red in places. There won't be so much pollution. And that itself will show us that our action has a reaction from Earth and a thank you from Earth. I think that will, that will be a good thing to do. So um, as we are closing in to our end time, one last but not the least, um, uh, Katha recently released a book, uh, e-book if I'm correct, on the COVID-19 for children, right? So could you also share some uh, bit about that uh, with us? And uh, if you have something to say about it or if you want to narrate a part of it, like quickly in like sum it up in like one or two minutes. So. <laughs> okay, here I am sitting in Chennai and I had just gone out the day before, the day COVID was uh, announced actually. I had been to a Fisher uh, people's colony uh, outside of Ennore. And uh, there were all these children, they, they come to a night school. And uh, they are children who are not able to read very well. They're all first generation school goers. So they come to the night school, they are learning over there. And I was there and uh, I, I love to hug, as you must have known. I love to hug. So there I was hugging everyone and, you know, talking no, to I... the kids and, you know, sitting and talking and, you know, doing things. And uh, it's also Tamil, so I'm a Tamilian. So we were all sitting and talking and I came home. I feel so, so thrilled with myself. And my sister told me, Gita does not write it. Well. I mean, you should not have done this. I mean, we have to be careful about the COVID. Suddenly I realized that for our children, there is nobody to tell them. I have my sister to tell me. Who, the, who, the, who is there for the children to tell them? What is the coronavirus? What can you do? There are just two simple things that they have to do. They have to wash their hands and they have to keep a distance. Those are the only two things that we are saying. Wash your hands and don't touch your face with your hands. And that's something that we all do. We touch it, I think, I must be touching it 10,000 times a day, I think, touching my face. So how do we tell them? So this book was, Something that I, uh, I'm sorry for saying the I, but I, I, hate, I like the hum of hum. I don't like to say I, but in this case, I took just seven days to write the story, to get the illustrations, to get the design done, lay it out, get the font, get the translations done from friends and people who just came in so willingly. So it was translated and then we had all these languages. Now we have it in five languages. And we had a team in Qatar. And we had uh, Vikram, I must mention Vikram, who came, who didn't stay at home. He walked in the night all the way from home to the office. So he could come and sit there for those ten, seven days. And he could work with me. And he could bring this book out as an ebook. So it was not just me. It was Ayushri and Vikram and uh, Raju and a whole bunch of people who came in. Uh, after the first three days of intense work and saying, kush na kush to hume karna hai. there's no way that we are just going to keep quiet. We have to tell the children that it's possible. And I think we were one of the, I think we, we did something good, I think. The ebook, I wish it could have been a print book. We wanted to print copies of it, but no press was open, so we couldn't print it. So it is, um, there is a little uh, limitation there because it has it needs a smartphone it needs somebody to take it but we are hoping we've shared it with about nearly a 500 600 non-profits we've shared it with about 3000 schools with children with teachers in different languages in maharashtra in tamil nadu in, in assam in the, all the north indian states so i think maybe somebody has benefited from it i hope so i'm wishing that somebody has the story is, of course, about uh, about this coronavirus, which wants to invade the whole world, and how a group of small children and girl, this girl called Lachmi, uh, does something. She comes up with an idea. It's such a simple idea that 
the coronavirus all ran away from there and there's no one there in none of the coronavirus it's almost like lighting the labs and thinking that you know if i little lab when in nine minutes the coronavirus will die so like that i think you know <laughs> i'm hoping <laughs> that the coronavirus will run away with every child washing their hands and not touching their face and keeping a distance so i think uh i have personally read it and i thoroughly enjoyed the book and uh so on that note uh i would uh ask everyone to please go visit katha's website katha.org and have a look at the books have a look at the earth carer series have a look at the mystery of the missing so we didn't mention the name of this ebook so it's it's freely available to download please share it uh, amongst your peer groups give your children a read like it's 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 a fun book the visuals are amazing as ever and uh, i'm not saying it uh, because just because i have to but because i actually mean it as well <laughs> so that's the that's the tough job and um, on that note i would um, like to thank everyone for joining us thank you geeta ma'am thanks indra thanks iycn thanks katha for making this happen and uh, you know coming together on such an auspicious day on such an important day and talking about what actually matters you know as uh, many of us many a times wait for something to happen and uh, no one other than geeta ma'am would have been a better person to actually be here to actually guide us and uh, be an example of how uh, as, as an individual we can do so many things in so many fields you know and uh, i'm uh, that can be a little bit of buttering as well but okay thank <laughs> you <laughs> so i think you have a small appeal to make whenever yeah. you're done yep so i'm just wrapping up so thank you ma'am uh, so thank you. and thank everyone, you so much. Uh, shortly be receiving a mail from all of us all the people who have attended katha has a small gift for you all and uh, yeah thank you for being here to uh, and taking out time for being with us you know thank you so much so thank over you. to you in thank you all thank you thank you once again geeta and kartike uh, small thing i won't take too long so uh, as you can see on the poster the theme for this year for iycn is planetary health and food security which means that this is the cause that we have dedicated ourselves to as an organization for this entire year and uh, we request you whoever is attending the webinar and if you are interested in joining us or even collaborating with us on different topics which are attached to planetary health and food security or anything remotely related to this please feel free to write to us once again at um, contact at iycn.in or on our facebook or instagram pages you're welcome to reach out and uh, maybe we can collaborate and conduct more webinars or workshops together uh, and whatever you really like so even if you have questions about what planetary health means or food security means you're welcome to send your questions in thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you thank you everyone if you have any as just taking forward and reiterating what indra said if you have any questions do reach out to both the organizations indian youth climate network and katha they have their respective social media handles and uh, yes uh, please stay in touch do join both organizations both organizations are doing great work and need volunteers this point <laughs> cannot be stressed enough you know yes. more hands more effort the more people we can uh, reach and we can actually make things better for together and for our children you know for our future their generations so yeah thank you thank you ma'am thank you indra thank you Thanks, thank you bye bye bye, bye. bye. thank you for being here thank you bye